Hey guys, Vincent Kirkov here. The new errata just dropped and I thought I'd make a quick video to give you guys my first impressions. Before we get into the video, I want to point you over to my Patreon. Episode 4 of Guild Ball Gotchas is live over there and it covers Puppet Master, Lure, and Seduced. Please go check it out. Alright, back to the video. Keep in mind, these are my first impressions and I am bound to get some interactions wrong somewhere. We are also varying from our normal structure and going in unscripted. Alright. First up, we have Shark. Shark lost Gudden String, removed and replaced with Stagger. Target enemy model suffers minus one defense. Caught in the net, pulse size reduced to six inches. Uh, the Stagger change is the bigger one in my opinion. The loss on the two inches of the legendary play is somewhat more minimal. But losing the access to the non-legendary movement debuff was a big part of what made Shark incredibly strong and somewhat unfun to play against. Now playing Alchemists, I never really struggled particularly against Shark. The Corsair was always dropped into me. Right? But I really get how slower teams or teams that relied on positional synergies like Brewers could really, really struggle into uh, Shark's Legendary and uh, stacking that with Gut and String. So overall, I think this is fine. Next we have Siren 1, Influence Attribute reduced to 2-3 from 2-4. I really, really like this change. Siren 1 is incredibly difficult to play against because of how uh, Seduced work works. I did a Guild Ball Gotcha on it just recently. It's actually only available to patrons right now. Reducing her top-end influence heavily affects how strong her stealing the ball is. Right now the problem is, is she jogs up to you her seven inches and then has her six inch range and she puppet masters the ball off you receives the ball and if the pass is successful she takes a four inch dodge away from you and then she kicks the ball to a teammate taking another four inch dodge away so she is incredibly far away and it's just two fairly reliable dice rolls by removing that top end influence she can't take the other four inch dodge and she has to kind of sit with the ball on her or she can unsnap it. It's an enormous nerf. I really like how they handled it. Siren still does what she's always done. She's still just as hard to deal with, but you don't instantly lose the ball if Siren's positioning is bad. Next we have Vet Siren. Vet Siren's playbook has been reworked. It's massively different now. Now we have one unmomentous uh, momentous dodge, momentous dread gaze, momentous push dodge, two damage, tackle, and then on the on the fourth column we have momentous dread gaze push dodge. Now this changed quite heavily. Right, I really like that they added the extra column. For some reason, Siren was the second best beater in the entire faction behind their beater captain, and taking that momentous damage away from her and making it harder for her to wrap means she doesn't take tack buffs as well so you don't just like get two crowd outs and all of a sudden she produces two momentum and four damage with every single attack i really really am impressed by how subtle this change is and how good it is while still keeping siren to generally doing what she did before but she just doesn't do damage momentously anymore and she doesn't have the absurd output from it anymore really really like this change all right now we get into the thing that i'm sure everyone's curious about my opinion on which is the change to alchemists overall it is a massive nerf to alchemists we're going to start off with midas midas lost light footed which was kind of sneakily one of his best rules super shot is removed this is a big deal because of how it impacts the feet the extra die on the feet was really helpful because if you miss that goal Feet doesn't happen. Uh, Lure of Gold changed to once per turn. Uh, this is a more corner case type thing. This happens when Midas makes multiple attacks and is just increasing his gang ups when he's like wrapping to the three or if he's managing or if he's just managing to get to the three and just being like, I want one more dice. Let's move a guy over here. Generally, I can think of like two or three times that I've ever used Lure of Gold more than once per turn, so not the biggest problem. And then Promise of Fortune, which is the heroic, uh, lost the armor. It is now just a two-inch dodge. 
This has wide, massive implications. Reminds me a lot of the obulus nerfs, to be honest. Right? Midas was is largely considered the top captain right now. Back in Season 2, Obulus was considered the lar- uh, the strongest captain. right? And they nerfed him in multiple ways. And I think, overall, Midas would survive this, but some other players have changed, and I'm not sure how viable Midas is as a captain anymore. But we'll get into that after I've covered all those players. Right now, I think, if this was the only change to Alchemists, I still think Midas would be the absolute top tier captain. The loss of life footed hurts, so he can't just ignore terrain. You have to be kind of smarter about your placement with terrain. Uh, the loss of super of super shot uh, takes two inches off his goal threat, which is probably like the most respectable nerf. He no longer scores from 23 inches away. It's just 21 now. Uh, and then the loss of promise of fortune's armor means that he is more killable half the time but it's still largely protected by unpredictable movement. All right, vitriol change. Cover of darkness removed. This is her increased speed. Uh, Hidden damage removed, which is the once per turn idea, one extra damage. Her playbook was changed. The uh, two damage moved up a column. And uh, the three damage double dodge is no longer there. It's just three unmomentous at the top. She lost the three unmomentous damage on five. So essentially the momentous double dodge moved down a column and separated from the three. Uh, They reduced her hit points to 10, and now she only recovers back to five hit points. And now she has a new trait called I've Been Burnt Before. At the start of this model's activation, choose a model that is suffering the burning condition or the poison condition that is within this model's melee zone, this model may immediately make a two-inch dodge away from the chosen model. To summarize, uh, she's actually a little bit a little bit harder to pin down because of the new trait. So the new trait is very similar to Cover of Darkness, uh, except that it requires something to be on condition, but it does not say enemy, right? So you could put Cat 1 within two inches of her, and she could take that dodge. She still has the same total goal threat, of uh, that she did before. Uh, I cover it in my Guild Ball Gotchas episode one. You can look at that over there. So her overall goal threat is still the same. Her ability to fight, though, is significantly reduced. She doesn't reliably do two damage four times anymore, or at least not without massive gang ups or some other kind of tech buffs. Uh, the loss of hidden damage, uh, like I can take it or leave it, I'm fine with that. The loss of two hit points is a big deal. She is super fragile now, and she was already mildly fragile before, but clone and the five defense really made her a pain in the butt to go after. Overall, I think the changes are probably fine. I think she moves out of the staple position where you put vitriol down every single game, and she's now more of a flex. It's like, oh, I need a really good kicking model, or I want kickoff pressure. But if you're receiving in like a smoke lineup, I don't see any reason why you need vitriol anymore. All right, moving on, we have Ox. He has a massive rework to his playbook. I have it up here on the screen. I'm not going to walk through it. Uh, The big thing is, is that he deals significantly more damage. When you first look at it, it doesn't seem like that big of a change, but the other thing you have to keep in mind is that Ox's aura applies to himself. So each of its printed values are one higher, and then uh, on feet turn, they're two higher. So if he's hitting, if he's wrapping to the one, let's say, in Magical Christmas Land, he's doing uh, six damage on the top end plus another three, so nine, right? Which is a far, far cry from before. Also, butchery moving down a column and coming with better damage is also a big deal. Uh the buff is huge. It's very, very strong. Ox is now the killiest captain in the world. But Ox was kind of a support captain. And I would have much rather seen them buff other models that worked really, really well with Ox than change his playbook and make him personally dangerous. Uh, next up, we have Hammer's rework. I 
really, really like this. My practice partner, Nick, is a Masons player and has blind hammers change ever since he lost his top end influence. And the home crowd change, which made him very susceptible to counterattacks. Uh, this is, is freaking awesome. Uh, playbook's massively changed. He has a tackle knockdown momentously on two, which is just super sexy. I really, really like that result. And then he has a two damage knockdown on four. So that one damage knockdown that was on three has moved. And so this makes it technically harder for him to one round people or less reliably one round people he has to knock down if he doesn't hit that four. But he can audible out of it onto the two, which I really like. Um, but it just makes him feel more like the superstar all-rounder he was supposed to be. I really, really like the change to it. They kept it well within what you expect from Mason's low momentum uh, or low momentous results, high, really sweet, unmomentous results. Really like the change. Uh, all the character plays have gone to six inches. This is great. He's going to be more flexible, easier to play. Uh, the skill ceiling or the skill floor has raised. I really like that part of it. And then my new favorite thing about him is that Hammer Time is now a legendary play. Hammer Time now reads that it is a six inch aura when each other friendly guild model starts its activation within this aura. Choose either plus two plus two move, plus one damage to playbook damage results, or plus one plus O oh kick. The other friendly guild models gain the chosen benefit for the remainder of the turn. So it's essentially, they get to pick Punishing March, Iron Fist, or Ball Hog when they start their activation in the legendary play. This is amazing. Right? There's really, really interesting ramifications of this. All of a sudden, Chisel is actually kind of interesting when you she could be tooled up, hammer-timed, and painful-raged. So doing plus three damage on all of her results in kind of a fairly reliable way and for free. I think it's pretty interesting. You could take her as a reach tackle bot and then on feet turn, she's personally dangerous. I think that's super, super interesting. And then Hammer's also going to have this play style where he kind of tries to take control of the middle of the pitch. And then on feet turn, we'll send these deadly missiles out from the pitch to really mess people up. I think this is an enormous buff from Mason's. Uh, you compound this with there are some nerfs coming up that affect almost every team in the game except for Masons. Masons are the only team that got strictly buffed across the board and didn't lose anything powerful. And even though I'm so excited about these hammer changes, I still think you will mostly see Anna because she's such a strong captain. She has really good ways to break stalemates, and I... Me and the strictly the worst, rest of the strictly the worst guys really think that's the direction that this game is going. I still think you'll see her, but man, new hammer looks awesome. All right, next up we have Harry the Hat. Harry the Hat has been brutally hit with the nerf bat. Uh, crazy removed. Health recovery level adjusted to tenth box. Tech increased to five. Playbook edits shown on the ppt so playbook has changed his playbook is massively worse it's one column shorter he no longer has the combined uh push and damage results that momentous two double push that was on four before him before was really his bread and butter and that's gone now so he has one damage on one push on one retains double push on two and knockdown on three his unmomentous two moved to his third column, meaning he's not super reliable to just put eight damage on something if you need it. Tackle's now up to four, meaning that uh, he's no longer one of the best reach tackles in the game. At tech seven, tackle on three. Uh, and then he has a momentous three on his top end, and no longer the momentous three knockdown that it was. The recovery change is probably fine. That's in accordance with uh, crazy models. Crazy models all got buffed to have better recovery than the strict cut-in-half HP that most models do. Uh, I think you're going to see Harry disappear from nearly every team that plays him. I think he still is very playable in Brewers and in Union, especially while receiving, because he kept Inspiring Hat, uh, and he still uh, has a very dangerous counterattack, even if it's at Tech 5, 
right? Hitting that double push when somebody comes into you is a big, big deal. And it can just be activation ruining. He's still a must knock down model. But he is going to struggle to hit that knockdown on three. And that was what a lot of teams took him for. They took him for the easy pushes so they could set up stuff and then the knockdown setups. I still think Brewers can make good use of this. I still think Union can make good use of it. There's some serious talk as to whether Benny and Harry straight compete for a slot. But I think you definitely play Harry if you receive, especially on like a Blackheart team, where uh, the inspiring hat aura is really, really abusable with your kicks. He's straight gone from the Alchemist roster, in my opinion. I'm not 100% sure who I replace him with, but he no longer is just this super powerful bruiser that we can put alongside uh, Catalyst 1. And these three nerfs to Alchemists, uh, Harry the Hat being lumped in with them, I think really put Alchemists into the middle of the pack. Uh, These were three of our all-star players. We were a team that was very shallow, that had five or six really, really strong players, and then three flex players. And that was essentially how the team ran. The change to Harry the Hat is just, uh, it's really a game changer for Alchemists. So this is why I said that the Midas change feels like Obulus. All of these nerfs to Alchemists feel very justified and totally fine by themselves. But when taken together, I'm... And not exactly sure what a Midas team looks like anymore. Uh, Midas team used to always be Midas Vitrio, Cat 1, uh, Mascot, and Flex. And this was because Harry and Catalyst were such a monstrous brood squad that it, they were just really hard to come into, and they were really durable. And I get that that had to change, and I am fine with that. I'm actually really, really excited about the nerf to Harry. I'm sick of against playing against... Harry in every single matchup. I hate how he removes the flexibility if I want to be competitive in my list. I feel like if I don't play Harry, I'm playing the game wrong. Uh, I like that that's changed. I'm really excited about what this does to shake up the meta. And I was really worried he was going to be passed over because uh, he was so maligned in his first version. I think he's just, he's still absolutely a fine model. He just lost his damage output. I'm curious as to whether Rage still wants him, because Rage still wants a setup piece, but I'm not sure that with how hard that knockdown is to hit, that he is still that setup piece. But you know what? I'm excited to see him, and I'm really excited for what this does to the meta, even though it hurt my faction really, really badly. All right, here we go. The big one, Avarice and Greed. About half of the patch notes for this patch are Avarice and Greed changes. Uh, It's another... A complete and total rework of these guys making it their second rework. Uh, they're no longer a striker. All right. Avarice. Attack reduced to 5. Influence changed to 2-3. Singled out removed. Many hands make light work removed. Detach removed. Playbook is uh, changed. A uh, new character play called Drop Me Off. If Friendly Greed is on the pitch and is not suffering the taken out condition. The Friendly Greed may be placed on the pitch in base contact with this model. It's a zero-cost character play. Uh, Also once per turn. A new trait called Hit That One. While the named Friendly Model, Greed, is not suffering the taken out condition and is not on the pitch, this model gains plus two tech. So he's tech seven while Greed's inside of him. New trait called Thuggery. While this model is within one inch of the friendly greed, this model gains plus one damage to playbook damage results and adds the knockdown playbook result to each successful attack it makes. All right, we're going to pause there before we get to greed. Uh, Thuggery is really thematic. I really like it. It's like greed's out there and he's tabletopping whoever. Uh, It's important to note that it's just within one inch of greed. Right, Greed doesn't also have to be engaging the model. So you can kind of keep Greed safe if it's a dangerous position and put him behind Avarice. But that's a thing you want to do. Detach is a character play, so you essentially have to activate it. I think this just cleans some stuff up instead of it just being like kind of an activated trait on the back. I think it really just like cleans up and works more with how the game works. Uh, The changed playbook is pretty good. It's no longer a Brewer's playbook unless Greed's in him. Uh, It's five long. One damage on one, double push on two, two damage on three, 
tackle on three, three damage on four, knock down on four, uh, three damage double push. Now, this playbook is actually like really, really terrible unless you're just looking for straight damage and have a bunch of gang ups. But once Thuggery is added, this gets kind of incredible because he's effectively tax six because you're going to engage with greed. And then all those damage results are one higher and they also come with a knockdown. So he has two damage knockdown momentous on one. That's bananas. It's absolutely so good. Avarice and greed are going to be this incredibly hard to protect model that is going to be absurdly strong. All right, greed. Move change to 3-6. Tack reduced to 4. Kick reduced to 1-4. Influence change to 0-2. Where'd they go removed? Rabbit animal removed. In sync removed. Reattach removed. Playbook edits. Uh, gain singled out. Gains new character play called Pick Me Up. This is a cost 1. If this model is not in possession of the ball marker and is in base contact with the friendly avarice, this model rem may remove all conditions and remove itself from the pitch. Uh, gained new trait ready to go. This model may be allocated influence while it is not on the pitch. All right. So big change here is that greed can sit inside avarice safely. You don't lose influence because the two influence that avarice and greed gave is not, sp is not spread across the two. It is both on avarice. You can leave greed inside of avarice no real big issue here. And it costs one back to hop in Everest. So if you want to protect greed that way, there's an inefficiency issue. Singled out is now on greed. So you have to kind of expose him. Maybe if you want to single something out. And he's now terrible at striking. Their crazy long go threat, it's gone. Greed's not good at kicking. I think this reflects what I understand of the fiction of Avarice and Greed more, where they don't really understand the rules of Guild Ball and they just try to murder people, which was really strange because they're the like one of the better strikers in the game. Uh, overall, I really like it. Like It's wild. This changes every team. If your team is a team that can actively protect them, like uh, I think Smoke is capable of doing this. I think Masons with their overlapping countercharge bubbles are capable of doing this. This is a huge payoff piece. Like, the amount of damage that Avarice can put out with just the tech buffs that he brings is really, really great. The ideal circumstance for Avarice and Greed is super high. But if Greed dies, Avarice is pretty trash. So, I'm really excited to see what these guys do on the pitch. I'm not quite sure if they're, like, an A+, plus, a B-, minus, or if we'll see them at all. right? But I'm super excited, definitely going to test them out. And then lastly, we are going to end on two buffs. We have Hunter's buffs, finally. Theron, gained light-footed. Shocked by this. Honestly didn't know he didn't already have light-footed. His playbook's gotten significantly better. Pinned is now cost two instead of cost three. Uh, Air to the Knee has been replaced with a new character play called Snipe. It is minus two, minus two kick, and two damage, just like it was before, but it is not once per turn anymore. Uh, the reason they changed the name here is because Arrow to the Knee is also on Salvo, and they couldn't, they didn't want to buff Salvo for no reason when he just would get hit accidentally by this change. They changed the name of the character play, made it not once per turn. Uh, Sunstrike's new wording, uh, you can essentially do it to yourself now. This is exciting. I mean, I, I still think that Hunters don't have a great faction around them, but now they actually have two decent captains, which is a big deal. We've seen what two very good captains in Fish does, but man, this guy's going to be a little bit of a force to be reckoned with. Being able to allocate him six and have him snare three people from ranged is going to be really, really strong. Oh, I'm sorry. The last thing, I skipped it. Blessing of the Sun Father can also target yourself now. So, potentially, if you have momentum, you could do snare four things from ranged and put out damage. That's pretty darn good. Uh, I'm really excited to see what he does on the pitch. Uh, I'm not going to be picking up Hunters anytime soon. I still think the faction's uh, on the struggle bus, but, man, this goes a long way. He might actually be a legit control captain. 
All right. And our last thing in the Aretta, uh, original Hearn had his playbook changed to have a momentous healed ball on one. So the singled out is now momentous. And then he shares the change to the Blessing of the Sunfather. I still think he won't see play unless there's an egregious forest on the board. Uh, essentially, that one three influence is really his problem because you really can't play Hearn and the Bear. You're playing like a 10 influence team then. And uh, that's the end of the Aretta. Overall, I'm pretty darn happy with it. There's a couple models I really wish they would have hit. I think uh, No Mortician's buff was a big disappointment for me. I really want to see them rework Scalpel. I don't think you can ever play her over Obulus. Uh, and she's infinitely counterattackable. I think they just they need to do something with her. I also want to see Gast's influence increase so that way we can get him in more rosters so it doesn't hurt so bad to have to take a 1-4, choose between him and Caskets, and Casket time I think is a big key part of how they win their games. Uh, I'm also sad to see you no know, Esther's buff. Uh, Taffer is just leaps and bounds ahead of Esther's and his his power. But otherwise, pretty good Arata overall. I mean, they, they took a lot of stuff away from people. I always like to see on Arata's where they take something from a team and they give something back. But that's not really the goal of the Arata. They wanted to bring fish and alchemists off of that S tier down to the rest of the pack, pull everything in tighter. Uh, if we talk about big winners in this, I think the big winners are Masons and Brewers. And then probably, I still think Butchers have major problems. I think those are the, uh, the top two. Masons got a buff, didn't get hit by any of the nerfs. Brewers didn't get any buffs, but only lost Harry. I still think that faction is an absolutely fantastic place. I also think New Harry isn't that bad for them. They were mostly taking him for the pushes and the knockdown. And if they can get him up to hitting that knockdown with a gang up or two, I think uh, he's going to be in great shape. Plus, they already have somebody that kind of does what Harry does, which is Tapper. Tapper with really low knockdown, good access to pushes, good setup piece. But Avarice and Greed also might be really good for them, giving them something like a uh, a first activation that isn't Tapper, which is super odd for them. Like, you have to go with Tapper every single time first in Brewers. And then if we talk about exploring the meta from there, if those were truly are the two top dogs, really, really strong character plays will go up in value. We'll see a meta pick of Engineers. Engineers being really, really stronger than they should be because of the strength of character plays, and the low defense of the top dogs. And then, oddly enough, I think Smoke is going to see a resurgence here. I think if those two teams are the ones on top, you have can play a really strong keep away game, especially if you receive. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to leave it there. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments down below if you liked it. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at the Kirkov, And then... Let me know if you guys like this. Tell me in the comments. Is this freeform thing a thing you want to do? You want me to do? Do you prefer my scripted stuff? Let me know. I'm Vincent Kirkov, and this has been some kind of a rata talk. <laughs>